Happy Hump Day from Dallas ahead of the Cotton Bowl. That is Bill Landis, Jeremy Birmingham. I am Austin Ward, and it is the Podcast Daily. And we got a little snappy jays, some practice observations out of the way on Tuesday. And then, Bill, we heard from Jim Knowles and five Ohio State defensive players, the Silver Bullets, Steel Chambers, rocking an actual Silver Bullet gifted from Jim Knowles to him. Oh, wow. Just driving Just him? Wow, thanks, Jim. I think Tommy Eichenberg got one as well. I don't know if the whole room did. or Maybe just like a parting gift. Just the guys who were moving on, which Jim Knowles graciously mm-hmm. decided to tell us as part of what we learned <laughs> on Tuesday about the defense, is that those two pieces are going to have to be replaced. I think we, we all knew that about Tommy Eichenberg, who's going to the Senior Bowl. Steel Chambers had an option for one more year, and he was like, ah, I'm not going to talk about it. And Jim Knowles was like, nah, he's gone. Yeah, Jim Knowles, like in the course of, I think, maybe answering a question about C.J. Hicks or just maybe like young players in general said, we're not expecting Tommy back, we're not expecting Steele back. Um, but he is expecting like a full boat, basically, for the Cotton Bowl. The one guy that he said is a little uncertain at this time is Tommy, who we mentioned on Snap Judgments, like was dressed for practice, but not in full pads like everybody else. But aside from Tommy Eckenberg, it really does sound like Jim Knowles is expecting more or less the Ohio State defense we saw all year play in the Cotton Bowl, which is Pretty cool to see. Then they got to answer a bunch of questions about what that would look like for 2024. And we've been talking about that burn for the last several weeks. There's nothing new to really cover there. Denzel Burke said he had a date in mind. Jack Sawyer said uh, a pretty amusing situation there where uh, someone, I think Spencer Holbrook asked him about playing against Akron next year. And he was like, well, more than likely, like they've been asked a dozen different ways. They're probably getting pretty tired of it, but it's, it's still, I guess the reason that it continues to come up is that it feels like it's because Ohio State's going to get a bunch of good news. Yeah, and the situation for Denzel Burke is decidedly different than the decision for Jack Sawyer, aside from the fact that, I mean, I don't know that Jack would probably be a second-round pick right now. I think Denzel would be, um, but also at defensive line for Ohio State, if Jack moves on, it changes a whole lot more than, like Denzel, Like the line of progression is pretty much there, so we know if Denzel decides to move off the NFL, Jermaine Matthews steps up. This is the way it goes. But so I don't know that that one. He said January 10th for a decision. Why January 10th? I guess because he's already he, made his decision. He's made the decision. He's just not going to reveal it on January 10th, which is five days before the NFL deadline to do so. Um, I don't know. That's kind of weird to me. Like if, if you know, I would just tell people after the game on Friday so everyone can know what they're doing. But that's cool. Um, Bottom line, I think it, it's trending towards what we've been thinking for the last three, four weeks. Like, it feels like a lot of these guys, the intention is to return to Ohio State for the 2024 season, but people are leaving the door open in the event that something changes. Denzel Burke and a live microphone are just an <clears throat> ideal combination. That was one of the best, most entertaining press conferences you're going to find. Has he made, I was asking someone else about this, like in terms of transformations from when guys get here, to like when they're going to leave or have just been here for a few years, has there been a better improvement than what Denzel Burke was as a true freshman when it was like nearly impossible to get two words out of him? <laughs> and now he's just like super confident and talking trash when necessary, like holding guys accountable when it's necessary. And, and is just really thoughtful about things, including his own decision to go to the NFL, right? He was talking about the, the money difference between being a second round pick and being a first round pick and then being a first round pick and being a top 10 pick. Which is what he said his goal is. Yeah, which is a pretty big deal. So I, I thought all of those um, points were, were things that made me think he's probably going to come back, but I guess we'll find out on January 10th. He certainly laid out a case that all of the breadcrumbs pointed to coming back because he was pretty specific about that, that his goal was to be a top 10 pick. We know that that's not the draft feedback that he's received at this point. He talked all about the 2021 class, leaving a legacy, being able to tell his kids someday that he was at Ohio State. And right now he says he's got nothing to show for it. Um, we've heard that from these guys and like, it's going to kill Marvin Harrison Jr. that he's in a situation where he needs to go, has to go, is going to go pro. And, and, and a lot of these guys that are coming back are doing so to accomplish something that he wants to do, which is to beat Michigan, to win the Big Ten again, go to a college football playoff, win a national championship. But if 90, percent of these guys facing that decision come back and it's Marvin and maybe one or two that that don't go Ohio State's way that's this is a significant offseason and it is primarily a huge boost for the defense yeah and again as different as the decision is for a cornerback as a defensive lineman the difference for Marvin Harrison who is likely a top three pick any one of those guys who was thinking about coming back were they a top three pick I don't think would be leaning in that direction so they're all on that borderline, that cusp of like, 
taking the next step and they want the opportunity to prove that that it's worth it uh that they're able to prove the nfl that they're worth it so they haven't done that yet marvin has and that changes the decision i mean that makes the decision pretty easy for one guy and pretty difficult for the other nine bill what else did you take away from uh, jim Knowles on tuesday i asked him about the duke stuff um about being a candidate for that job and seemingly like being interested in being a head coach again because I, I i think when he came here we all assumed that he would not be interested in being a head coach and he didn't say this directly but but i but i think he and, and what he said sort of suggested that that was the right read just that like duke you know holds a special place for him because he's been there for a long time he's not actively seeking out these opportunities but when one was presented to him he decided to talk to, to duke about it but he was pretty adamant like he's very happy at ohio state he said i've worked my entire career to be at a place that has the expectations that Ohio State has and then the resources to go chase those expectations. And that's always in the back of his mind. It always will be whenever opportunities get presented to him. So I thought it was a pretty strong and firm proclamation from Jim Knowles that like he's probably not gonna go anywhere unless like a team that chases national championships decides and wants to hire him as, him as their head coach, which seems unlikely. Um, maybe if one of those places wanted him to be their coordinator, that, that could be a conversation for him, but he, is, he has been chasing the pinnacle of the sport for his entire career. And he mm -hmm. arrived there a year ago when he took the Ohio State job. So I don't think he's eager to, to leave that anytime soon. There's only I mean, so much, I guess this will sound silly, not many places are going to be able to surpass the $2 million a year already that Jim Knowles is making at Ohio State. You know, we know that Penn State had some level of interest in him as a defensive coordinator at Texas A&M. Uh, he's been, you know, in discussion or was talked about for that position as well. And yes, it is possible for other programs to be like, you know what? Jim Knowles turned that into a top five national defense, a number two national defense in two years. Let's make it three and a half million. But those are those deals are pretty rare. And I don't think that the situation, partnering what Jim Knowles has talked about with his own career, the growth that Ohio State has shown through two years, maybe not even, you know, 99% of the way there, didn't close the deal against Michigan again in the second half. We can, we all know those factors for Ohio State, but with the level of veteran talent that it appears to be coming back, all those things blend together along with pretty good compensation to like, it didn't make a lot of sense for this to be a time for Jim Knowles to be like, well, that was it. It was a fun two years and I'm out of here. And even with what we all consider a touch of like acrimony between him and Larry Johnson, as far as their their philosophy about defense, no other place that he goes is Jim Knowles going to have the autonomy to do what he wants on defense the way he does at Ohio State. There's a reason Ryan Day calls him the head coach of the defense. And I, I do think that in some ways that title is not just honorary. He Ryan Day leaves defense to Jim Knowles and it if you go to Duke and you're the head coach and you're making two and a half million dollars, you are fired in three years. Like what, what is the difference what, or you're moving on? And, you know, and I thought that answer from Jim Knowles was like the prototypical why I really like listening to Jim Knowles talk. Like that was a well thought out response to a, a question that could have easily been shrugged off. And instead of saying, well, I'm not going to talk about that. We're focused on, he said, you know, I could do this, but, like the value of being the defensive coordinator at Ohio State is better than being the head coach at 95% of the programs in America. So like that, yeah. it's a very, it's kind of a, re, a unique response to something that I think people ask about a lot, you know, and, and that's, I, I, that's why I like Jim Knowles. I mean, he doesn't sugarcoat much, but he also says a lot without saying it, like he did about CJ Hicks uh, on, on Tuesday. It's Tuesday, right? <laughs> when we're recording this. Well, this is Wednesday. It's Wednesday's the so, podcast I mean, daily. You know, we talked about the on the Tuesday podcast daily. The question was, what what is going on with CJ Hicks? Because we don't, we weren't expecting Tommy Eichenberg to play. Maybe that's changing. Who knows? I guess we'll see. Jim Knowles was like he said that's still up in the air as of as of Tuesday's press conference. But he kept saying like there's a place for CJ Hicks, and so I was sitting there like that doesn't sound like he. I'm like, so is that as an edge rusher? Is that on the line? And he said maybe. I got more on that. As if to that. say, yes, I would like to see that, but I'm not making that decision by myself. So after he was done at the podium, he, he continued talking to a few of us about that. Um, and he said he considers CJ Hicks and Arvell Reese and Mitchell Melton similar. He calls them combo players, which is like, you know, the guys who would play the Jack. The if, Jack. If Ohio State would the Jack hmm. position. What but, could call? To, uh, maybe a Leo. <clears throat> yeah, Leo. Maybe if you're king, the king of the jungle. Um, but to the point of like CJ Hicks maybe like moving down a little bit, he was asked like, has CJ ever played defensive end? And he said like, not really, but when 
we're going against the offense and they want a specific look of something and you're just kind of like messing around a little bit. He said they have put C.J. Hicks on the edge and he's looked really good when they've done it. So I think it's probably what Jim Knowles would like to do. But then it raises the question of like, do you need to add a linebacker? Because if you're taking guys, he named two players who are currently in the linebacker room in Arville Reese and C.J. Hicks who might be better suited to play a hybrid position. And then do you need more linebackers? Like, how does that impact They don't the have that hybrid position. And if J.T. Fumalo and Jack Sawyer and those guys right. all come back, yeah. you still don't have that position on yeah. the field. Right. And I think that's where a lot of the question marks are like, how do you deploy Mitchell Melton and C.J. Hicks and Arvell Reese? Because he also mentioned Arvell Reese as a linebacker that's been standing out to him. So, like, they want to find ways to get these guys on the field. But... I don't know. I mean, it, it's not going to happen Friday is what is kind of the vibe I got. Yeah. Yes, that's for sure. When you talked about <clears throat> Gabe Powers and uh, the benefit of having Cody Simon coming back, who he said he was effusive in the praise of that. If you're looking at building the linebacker room, Ohio State views him as someone who could have started for just about any program in the country. He just happened to play with Steel Chambers and Tommy Eichenberg, though he did take Cody Simon a lot of uh, or a, a number of reps away from Steel as the year went on. So it, it feels like even though the numbers, Bill, like the scholarship numbers aren't bursting at the seams, like enough that you could loan out someone like C.J. Hicks if the situation presented itself. I, I know that you and I have talked about that a number of times, but it, that's the that's the interesting push-pull dynamic that we've discussed with the staff because whether that's, you know, Baron Browning five years ago or even, you know, moving around Chase Young and the Predator for like just one week and, and yeah. things get like – you know, I, I think that Jim Knowles wants to see more creativity and not in the in the scheme, the personnel, you know, every variety, flexibility from the defensive front. And I, I feel like CJ Hicks could be a really key part of that personally. Um, but it, it doesn't seem like there's complete consensus on what that should be and what the next step is. Yeah, I, I think it's complicated. I, my personal belief is that if you're only lining up and four down on every single snap, you're doing yourself a disservice. And I think you look across football. I just don't think there are a lot of teams that, that are ecstatic with it as Ohio State is. It's what they've been traditionally. It's not what Jim Knowles has been. So there's probably some conversations that have to happen in the offseason. And I, I did try to ask about that. And, um, you know, Jim Knowles said, you just try to put the players that you have in the best position to be successful. And like, clearly, they're built to be, I think, mostly a four down defense like they were for much of this year. We didn't really see any of the hybrid package this year. Like, I can't really recall seeing it once. Maybe the only time Mitchell Melton was on the field was when the other guys were off, right? right? Yeah, so so I don't. I, I think they need to be intentional about implementing more of that as we move forward, even with all the guys coming back on defense. Like, there has to be a world, I think, where all that coexists. Um, it's not a conversation for the Cotton Bowl, but I think it's a big conversation going into 2024. Verm, anything you heard from the five players? That no, I, mean, I think we were – Hoping to get a little bit of that juice like that was out there pre Rose Bowl about uh, Marvin and Emeka Abuka when, when Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson sat out. And I mean, we all kind of were trying to pull that out of Denzel a little bit. And he so well, he did, he for certainly one of them. does not um, hold back when talking about Carnell Tate. And, and I, you know, to call him, he said he was one of our three best receivers all year. Like, I think that Carnell Tate is one of those guys, and this is not meant to be a knock on Julian Fleming because he does a lot of he did a lot of great things for Ohio State. But I think it's one of those things where you walk out on a football field and your eyes go immediately to someone and you recognize that maybe they're a little bit different. Marvin Harrison had that Im impact on Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson, and Carnell Tate's had that impact on everyone since he arrived last January. Um, I just think that Denzel Burke's way of talking about the young guys was pretty refreshing. Like. He's got a ways to go. He's awesome. He's got a ways to go. Like, uh, that's really cool to me. We were talking about Brandon Ennis on Snap Judgments, and I think it was good maybe to get a little bit of those expectations tempered. Um, but he's still going to get a lot of run on, on Friday, I think. But um, the Carnell Tate hype train is officially, like, out of the station. Yeah, yeah and he and even in Denzel's own words, he, he tried to not suggest that that means Friday is going to be Marvin from two years yeah. ago in the Rose Bowl that he said, man, think about 12 more games for this kid and then a playoff next year and what he can become that he's going to be a first round pick. Not that he's been that at this point. In two but, years because he's still. Uh, well, still yeah, but left, that he, which is amazing, which will be yeah. the same, you know, the Marvin track where you clearly would have been a first yeah. round pick if you're able to do that. But uh, the, the battles, he said, you know, because some of that's been a little bit different for Ohio State in these bowl practices where Denzel is no longer just going against a bunch of veterans and, and Marv one of the best, the best wide receiver in the country, 
you know, Mecca moving around, Julian not being there at all. He's had a chance to line up against them. And it's not so much that Cornell Tate and Brandon Ennis are, uh, you know, been going to make Denzel Burke a top 10 pick the way those other guys are, but he can help bring them along and he's trying to teach them. And I think that's an interesting dynamic. Denzel was, he was not a captain. Uh, It was kind of crazy in hindsight, right? Yeah, because I think he is, I've said it before, I think he's the most important voice on the defense. And that's not a slight to Tommy Eichenberg's leadership or Steel Chambers' veteran presence or work ethic, but neither of those two guys are gonna go stand up, talk trash, throw a punch, you know, whatever, I mean, the way that Denzel was willing to do. Or talk to the media openly about what's going on. What's going on, yeah. And I think that that's that's important. If if people disagree with that, that's fine, so be it, I can live with it. I I think that when Ohio State has been at its best, it has those guys who are willing to take that accountability. I'd I'd even go back, like, we're talking about how great the development is over a couple of years of just listening to Denzel Burke talk about things. I don't know why, but it feels to me like the way that Chase Young challenged teammates throughout his career and like his press conferences were never the most loquacious chase youngs but there was never a moment where i was like well they don't have a heart heartbeat out there because chase could provide that or jordan fuller yeah, yeah. and bill denzel like it was asked about devin brown in that same role and mm-hmm. that was that seemed to be like the difference i guess in listening to him talk about devin brown versus what we heard all, all year long i don't think he wanted to say it like well now there's a guy in the quarterback room that people are like they respond to that way, but it kind of felt like that's what he was hinting at. Did I? Am I wrong? No, I kind of took it the same way, and I'm, I don't. I don't mean that necessarily be like disparaging toward Kyle McCord. I, I just really like. It's not even a skill set, at least physical skill set conversation for me. I just I think people on this team respond differently to Devin because Devin carries himself differently than than Kyle did, and I don't know that that guarantees you anything, but um, I think it is. You know, it's it's pretty clear to me that it's different. I asked uh, just quickly. Uh, yeah. I, I asked Denzel Burke because we were asking a bunch of questions about young receivers. Like to your point of holding people accountable, <laughs> I said like, "Hey, what we're talking about young receivers? Do you have any thoughts on Jeremiah Smith?" <laughs> and he like paused for a second. I was like, "I'm just kidding. I'm just being an idiot. You don't have to answer it." He's like, "No, I got something." <laughs> and then he said he said something to the effect of like, "I know he's a five star. Everybody thinks he's really good. It's different when you go against college corners. Let's get him in here and line up across from each other and see what happens." <laughs> say, oh. Oh, Bill, you have a question that you don't think is good enough to wait for this. Yeah, yeah. Would you like an answer? Here it is. Yeah, it was good. But got, it, was, it, was, it was a great peek inside the mind of, of how Denzel operates. Yeah. So we got that That's look. a peek inside the mind of how all these guys operate. Yeah. When you're at this level, you do not like to hear about five-star kids coming in that, that they're going to be better than people on the roster. Yeah. Like, it pisses them off. Josh Proctor or said. Or if it's suggested that they were put into the lineup without having earned it. Yeah. Which yeah, he didn't like that either. Josh Proctor um, said he has not heard back from the NCAA about a seventh year. I'm just kidding. I asked him just as a joke, like, yo, like, you get any word back? And he said, he said, if they throw him some NIL money, he'd consider it. Um, so that's where we are now. Yeah. I did. A, a, he, Josh Proctor, who famously loves NIL opportunities. He was, he was asked about, like, his favorite moment at Ohio State and, like, what stood out to him what, what the moment. And he brought up the Wisconsin game to hit on Jack Cohn. That, like, that's oh, yeah. the one that. It's like 10 years ago. Boy. And it, I mean, that felt like so long ago. And I, I, was recalling it with him how we were walking out on the field and Ryan Day was already on the field when he hit Jack Cone and Ryan stopped. He's like, oh, <laughs> like, oh or, or Josh like, I wish I could have seen that. I'm like, I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Yeah. Special opportunity for him. He's got, he said, I think 22 people coming down from Tulsa for what is finally, inevitably going to be his last game at Ohio State. He, he felt that was going to be the end for each of the last three years. And it turned out now he, he was sticking around and making it work and a really cool story and a chance for uh, him to go out on a high note for Ohio State on Friday night against Missouri. It's right up here. I don't know where no, the dates are. It's, it's behind me. Wherever. It's uh, it's Friday night. You guys know when it is. Two days away. Ohio State, Missouri here in the Cotton Bowl. A lot more coverage coming your way on the podcast. Later today, Wednesday, we'll go back and we'll have 15 more uh, minutes of open viewing practice. We'll have some snap judgments. And we'll talk to who knows which offensive players are going to show up. I think there's a chance that we're going to get Travion Henderson added to the schedule and an update. So he gets to answer questions for 45 minutes about his future. <laughs> uh, but he has been dressed and he was leading the line. And the people are waiting to Tuesday. hear about Jeremiah Smith. And we do talk to Brian Hartline on Wednesday. And people will certainly ask yeah. him about Jeremiah Smith. Probably this guy, Jeremy Birmingham. I bet I won't. Jeremy Birmingham. No, I, I, <laughs> this is not the time for recruiting questions. 
it's not always for me. Time for recruiting I'm questions. a I, I, I'm focused. Okay. Focused on the game, Mark. Good. Mm-hmm. Focused on the Cotton Bowl. Thanks for starting your Wednesday with us here on the podcast daily. That's Bill and Burham. I'm Austin. We'll see you guys later from AT&T Stadium.